Coming to you from the West Coast, this is Politicoast. Today is September 29th, 2016, and you're listening to Episode 1. Politicoast is the podcast that explores what is happening in British Columbia and around the country. I'm Scott. And I'm Ian. And every week, we're going to delve into what happened in the world of politics and what are the implications. Once a month, we're also going to take a special topic and break it down in detail for you. And of course, make sure to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. And make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, where we're at Pod. On today's show, we're going to cover what this podcast is going to be about, the Pacific Northwest LNG project, the latest in the housing crisis in Vancouver, and finally, some of our quick takes on various other stories. Segment one, what is this thing you are listening to? Okay, Ian, what's the driving force behind this podcast? I messaged you a couple weeks and said, Scott, do you want to do a podcast? But it sort of started in my head a few days before that when I was just had been listening to so many politics podcasts and everything else. And I go and I was just thinking, where are the political podcasts for B.C.? There's The Strategist, which is fantastic, but they're based in Alberta, where I'm from originally. And they cover that and the federal angle. And then there's the sort of CBC podcasts that cover the national angle pretty well. And then there's just like a couple call in shows and a couple things in B.C., And I thought there's nothing covering BC politics, or at least that lens. And I wanted to do something. So I messaged you. What was your first thought? Why not? I'd been uh, considering doing a uh, politics podcast for a little while. I really uh, take a deep dive in a topic of conversation or policy area every week. And uh, after we talked a bit about this, we settled on we're going to do that monthly and really focus on kind of the headlines going through here and what that means. Yeah. And I mean, I reached out to you because I know when we've sat around the pub or even on Facebook, when we see each other's posts, we're fairly closely aligned. We're both center to center left. I'm more left. You're more center. But we have disagreements. I think we're not exactly the same. And I think that made it more interesting for me. I mean, I have lots of friends who are very political and I could sit here and just agree with them for half an hour, an hour. But that's not interesting. Not at all. While we're on the topic, uh, what are your political views? I mean, I'll be honest, I've been a member of the NDP at different times. I, in campus, was actually a member of the Alberta Youth New Democratic Party. I think we had a view that, and this was before the NDP won Alberta long before, when it was sort of the fringe of Alberta politics. And so the youth wing had to take the more radical view, just for the point of being ironic, almost, because we were college students. And so... The youth wing would throw out things like Canada should nationalize the oil industry. And it's Alberta, so no one really took the youth wing seriously. But even more ironically than that, when I was in high school, I remember in like grade nine, one of my social studies teachers asked me to write, you know, an essay on who would you vote for? And I hadn't thought a ton about politics, but I grew up in Alberta in the 90s. And so I said, well, I'd have to vote reform because the West needs a voice. And it was only later I started to realize that voice is, you know, a bit ignorant and racist and not mine. And maybe we don't want that voice. And so I've grown more socially aware, I think, since then and just moved generally to the left. And how about you? Well, for me, the journey into politics really started back in 2001. Uh, I was 11 at the time and big events of that year in September really uh, kind of kicked off my interest in what was going on in the world at the time. And from there, it kind of just grew into uh, interest in policy, politics, all that sort of stuff. Uh, if anything, I think I kind of went the opposite way. Um, growing up on Vancouver Island in a fairly left-wing place, that was kind of the uh, general zeitgeist. And since then, especially after joining the military and whatnot, I tended to move slightly more to the center on... Uh, that sort of stuff, and started reading in uh, a bit more Hayek, that sort of stuff, and really kind of, I'd say, moved towards a more classical liberal approach. And that's basically, to the extent that I actually will slap a label on myself, I'd uh, put it as a liberal of the somewhat more European sense of the word, with a focus on individual liberty, a government that does what it needs to without being without going beyond that and being uh, larger than necessary, I suppose. Sure. And I mean, we both have our views, but I think we both have a desire to sort of approach this in a not journalistic sense, 
but maybe like a fair pundit who's willing to consider the different angles and, you know, we'll talk about conservative politics and we'll talk about maybe how conservatives should approach things. I mean, people, maybe they'll listen to our coverage of the Trump-Clinton debate on Monday. And we were obviously both biased in terms of who we support there because one candidate has experience and one is a stark raving liar who would lead the country into fascism. But, you know, we're, we'd we say... Well, this year has been so unusual down in the States. It's really hard to put a more traditional uh, spin and analysis on what's happening. So I think basically everybody in Canada minus three people more or less see Clinton as the better choice. So there were no real surprises in where we landed on that one. But if we were to look in the more BC lens or a more Canadian context and where the uh, political splits are, I think we'd see a lot more disagreement between us and uh, more back and forth on what exactly is the right course of action, who is best uh, to lead us forward. Yeah. And I mean, it's a very interesting time in Canadian politics because you have political parties getting elected. And well, I guess it's sort of always that way. They get elected and then they go back on their promises. And then the federal parties are totally at odds with their provincial counterparts. And so even with my history of involvement with the NDP, there are different NDPs right now. And the federal party is just driftless. And we're still trying to figure out what the provincial party is going to do. And we'll get into that definitely in these next two segments. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to be critical of them because I've you know, supported them in the past. But it also doesn't mean I'm going to be only critical of the BC Liberals. OK, we've discussed a bit about our own political views, but now let's uh, talk a bit more about what will be the show. Uh, so our goals for the show is to make a more West Coast focused politics podcast. Uh, we're not limiting ourselves to the West Coast and BC, but that's definitely going to be the lens through which we look at many of these issues. And what we'll try and avoid, but we'll probably fail at, is try and tone down the partisanship and avoid that. Yeah, that's just what I was talking about. You know, get to the different angles we can take on a story. You know, are these things good for or bad for anyone else, and how should they play it? All right, well, the big news for this week, obviously, was the approval of the Pacific Northwest LNG project. There was a lot of criticism for the Harper government for not getting resources to market there was also a lot of criticism for the way the Harper government approached environmental assessments. Now it looks like it's flipped around and you have Justin Trudeau, who ran on a more environmental platform, approving this massive project. So we'd be remiss not to cover this. This has been the story of BC all week. But I think for a bit of background, the Pacific Northwest LNG project is a massive project. It's planned to take over one of the islands just south of Prince Rupert. And there's going to be a production facility there to process and ship liquid natural gas. They're going to have about 650 workers, I believe, involved in full-time work and a bunch more involved in building pipelines that are going to help bring liquid natural gas in from across northern BC. One of the things Christy Clark promised in the last election and ran really hard on was that we would get liquid natural gas to the Asian markets and that would drive BC's economy forward. That's failed to materialize and now we have a potential approval. But that approval comes with 190 conditions, which the Trudeau liberals try to argue will dampen the environmental impacts. And those environmental impacts are not negligible. The estimates are that this project will increase BC's carbon output by 8% a year. That would be like our population going up by 8% and every one of those people putting out as much greenhouse gases. The counter argument, of course, being that this liquid natural gas will go to Asia and displace coal which is a very dirty and bad form yeah. of fuel. And that's the thing you've really got to look at is where is this uh, energy source going to be used and how is it going to be used? Not all energy sources are identical. We can't just plug and play and where the displacements happen. Obviously, if it displaces solar panels, we're at a net loss. But as you were saying, if we get rid of coal and replace it with natural gas or even in vehicles, a lot of uh, companies have been looking at transferring from dirty diesel engines to natural gas. So a lot more details and studies are going to need to be looked into exactly where those substitutions are going to be happening to get a really good idea of if this is going to be a net benefit or not. And on top of all of that, one thing that's happening in the broader economic climate is there's almost a flood of liquid natural gas as other jurisdictions have brought on plants and facilities that we've essentially failed or haven't done. And so there's even a big question mark over whether Petronas, the company that has applied to develop this project, 
will even go forward. I mean, there's a bunch of red tape in front of it now. And so the Conservative Party of Canada, who champions every pipeline, every oil resource development like it's pure gold, is critical that there are any restrictions and the government hasn't just built it themselves, essentially. But then on the other side of the aisle, you have the federal NDP saying it's the worst thing ever and it's going to be an environmental disaster and we can't meet our Paris Agreement targets while opening this facility. So I guess that sort of leads us into the discussion of how do at least each of the different political parties approach this? I mean, you have the federal political parties. There's obviously discussion about how this affects political parties. And then there's a sort of local level, too, I think, with the indigenous and municipalities. But maybe let's just start at the federal level. I mean, most obviously, this has implications for the liberals who are trying to thread the needle between environment and resources. Yes. And they've always had that... uh conflict going on, even during the election campaign, they were pretty clear they wanted at least one pipeline to be built. Uh, Exactly which one that was, a little unclear, and they weren't leaning heavily any which way, but overall Trans Mountain definitely seemed to get the most positive attention from Justin Trudeau. That's the pipeline that runs to Burnaby, BC. The Kinder Morgan Uh, one. The Kinder Morgan one. That's the existing pipeline, and there's a planted uh, twin the line which is also one that's opposed by all the Metro Vancouver, or most of the Metro Vancouver mayors. A lot of people around us are vehemently opposed to this. They're vehemently opposed to every resource development, of course. But it sort of puts that question mark up there of, if we set target for the country to lower our emissions by a certain amount, but then you approve a project that will increase them, We have this sort of, who's going to shut down their factories? Or who's going to take their cars off the road? Where are we going to get that greenhouse gases out of the air? And that's where carbon tax really comes in, really useful. Like BC right now, it's a $30 per ton tax, and they've kind of held it steady for the last several years, waiting for the rest of the provinces to catch up. Although I have heard that with this new approval, one of the things the federal government managed to get or secure was Christy Clark's willingness to look at increasing that in line with the Right, and we, we'll be hearing more about that when the uh, ministers meet later this fall at uh, the upcoming first ministers meeting to discuss a uh, national carbon price. There's definitely a role for carbon pricing in this. I think everybody will agree that maybe some of the most hardcore environmentalists that there's a role for fossil fuels, at least in the current economy. There is some uses which overall are a net benefit, even if it's just the diesel that was used to get the food to our supermarkets, whether it be from the Fraser Valley a few miles away or from California. So there's obviously a net benefit to some use, and other ones, the environmental costs are way too high. And the benefit of a carbon tax on that is rather than trying to nitpick and exactly figure out how much everything is, where it balances out, if you just put a price on the whole thing, on the environmental damage caused by it, that way everybody then has to factor it in. Marginal benefits, uh, those projects get shelved, and the ones that are really useful and actually do bring a large net benefit carry on. Right now, a lot of people are opposing these projects on the grounds that's going to cause more uh, fossil fuel use, right? And that yeah. uh, with pipelines, the argument goes, if we make it easier to move oil, it'll increase the usage of that oil. And But there's obviously some oil we're going to need to use, whether it's to drive or... Or it's even pl- manufacture plastics. Yeah, ma- manufacture plastics. So there's definitely a positive use for it. It's just the question, what are the costs? And rather than trying to make it as uncompetitive to move it, we should just be focusing on what's the actual cost and charge that directly rather than this roundabout way that a lot of opponents to the pipelines are going for. Fair enough. Do you think, bringing this back to the political parties, one comment I saw you make on this specifically was this might be the start of the end of the Trudeau honeymoon period. I mean, I was a bit more skeptical because it seems like the man is... Untouchable? You know, untouchable is a good term for it. Well, there's two things that will end a honeymoon period. Either a something big that butts the existing narrative and throws it into disarray, or something that will play off of an existing negative narrative that's floating in the public consciousness surrounding the liberals. And whether that's going to be 
the expenses that keep getting brought up again and again to play back into that old entitled recklessly spending liberal party that uh, got defeated back in 2006. Which is definitely the angle the Conservative Party is playing. Yes. Yes. Whether that be is going to be what finally sticks, who knows? Does I don't think it's going to be that. Or if it's going to be something that disrupts the existing narrative and throws it into sharp relief with between the expectations and the reality. And I mean, a big part of the Trudeau image has been just expectations. It's been all of that style with very little substance. On yeah. almost every issue, he's tried to avoid making a decision. Yeah, I, exactly. And I don't think anybody who actually paid attention during the campaign is going to be all that surprised by this announcement. Well, there was definitely an intent to put on a friendlier face to it. The actual detailed policies that were, if not outright friendly, not hostile to getting resources to market. So do you think we're going to see a drop in liberal support in BC? Or is there just nowhere else for it to go? So it'll just kind of be a, we disagree with the direction of the government, but we're... I think, I think there will be some support lost. Uh, you, the more left-wing side of the party and the base... I think you'll see a little bit of bleeding to either the NDP or the Greens after this. Uh, my sense is that a lot of progressives, even if they tend to be further past the liberals on the political spectrum, were more or less satisfied and found the liberals to be an acceptable party to park their support in, uh, especially if it meant getting rid of Harper. And now that that's gone as a political booty man, and the fact that the Liberals are fundamentally a centrist party starting to show up in their actual policy decisions, I think you'll see a lot of that port drift away and try and find a home elsewhere. Where exactly that is, hard to say. My guess is you'll going to see the undecideds. Those numbers will probably go up, and you'll probably see some go into the uh, Green Party. And, well, the NDP is in complete disarray right now, and they're not even really sure where their party's going, so I'm not sure how many people are going to be flocking to them at the moment. I mean, it's interesting. The project is actually in Nathan Cullen's writing, and he's one of the most popular New Democrat MPs out there. And I'm sure he's very strong on this issue, very strongly opposed. And I think I did read one or two stories that this is the sort of spark that's given Mulcair something to argue about again. But without any declared leadership candidates and with him on the sort of way out, it's hard for that party to really take a strong policy stance Whereas, I mean, the Conservatives have a clear policy and none of the leadership contenders are going to take a sharp turn from supporting projects like this. Yes, there's nothing that's going to, I think, drive any of them into opposition of this. I mean, maybe Michael Chong's approach would be well, a little bit different, or I maybe think, it'd even be closer to the Liberals. I, I think, if anything, he'd probably come out with something like what I was talking about earlier, where he's been on, on the record in favor of a carbon tax, a uh, revenue neutral model like PC. And I think he'd probably put forward a pretty similar position that you put, you price the carbon, you let the market figure out which projects are worth the costs to the environment because they now have to factor in those costs directly rather than as an unpriced externality, which they can just ignore. And if it if this one made sense, he'd be all for it. And if it doesn't make sense once you factor in those costs... I think you'd be satisfied the market's spoken, and and that's the closest I could see to someone actually opposing this among the conservatives. Yeah, where I think this gets almost more interesting politically, but also maybe more boring, is at the provincial level. I mean, this is obviously a win for Christy Clark. She gets to say something's finally green lit in this province, even with the conditions. Ironically, it might not happen, but she can say she didn't put up barriers. And so I don't and, know if there's anything else the BC well, Liberals can take from she has, this. Yeah, she campaigned on this last election. So this gets to be put in the promises fulfilled category with a, with an asterisk beside it. With but, a bunch of like asterisks a little bit late, but better than never. Exactly. But th this will definitely go on as a win for the Liberals. And they'll likely use this in their next election as a we deliver at LNG. Yeah. And I say it's interesting provincially because I tried to look up what the BC NDP's position on this was. And it was basically a criticism to Clark along that lines of why did this take so long? You know, jobs can't wait. You know, you need to get these things moving well be but they're also having that 
you know, dual tension of, but it should also be environmentally friendly. So they're trying to wag their finger on both sides. And that's what really killed them last election was the disconnect between the two bases of the party is you have your urban progressives who generally oppose resource development. And then you have the blue collar union base that really wants those jobs that these sorts of projects will bring. And I'm not sure the NDP's actually figured out where they stand on this in terms of a the broader philosophy but that underlies the party on this. They seem to be really trying to do this tactically rather than as a matter of principle. And so, I mean, maybe the win for them here is that by it being accepted, it sort of takes it out of an election issue because it's been decided and it's not like they have to now take a position on it because, well, the government's already approved it and they're not going to go back on that. And I think the other win for them would be if Petronas doesn't go forward with it, and then it's just, well, it's not going to happen anyway. Yeah, that'd actually probably be the best outcome as far as the NDP is concerned, because that really takes the question out of play. Because you will still have those people in the party who, even if it's being settled by the feds, have proven it, will still want to go back and relitigate the issue come of the election. But if the company that's putting up the money for it and actually doing it doesn't want to do it, then it's just a non-issue and goes away. I guess the final like angle for me that's also interesting, and it'll be interesting to watch going forward, is how the local and indigenous groups going. There's a lot of noise from those who are opposed, and that's their right. But this isn't a project that is uniformly opposed by First Nations groups. There actually are quite a few who you know, signed agreements because they see a way to get jobs for their community, to get, you know, royalties or money for their community. And that's probably an important way forward for reconciliation. But there are others who take the environmental stance and you're seeing, I think, a unifying of a lot of Indigenous groups coming together and really taking that environmental stance. And it's becoming, I think, more politically powerful than they've ever been. And that's probably a good thing given our terrible history with First Nations groups. But it's going to make politics a lot harder for future projects like this, I think. Yes, and uh, the politics of it is always going to be one of the big challenges. As you saw with the uh, pipeline issue in the National Energy Board, is that there isn't even agreement on what the process should be to approve these, let alone uh, agreement to abide by it once it uh, comes out. You, I... you haven't heard much about this recently, but... Uh, a year ago, back during their campaign, there was a lot of talk about, you know, what social license meant for these projects and how that would play into it. And you really haven't heard a peep from the liberals on that uh, since the election. I was reading one good long form piece in McLean's today about the sort of pipeline politics, and it came all the way up to this latest Pacific Northwest uh, approval. I talked about how the Liberals did open up a few more of these discussions to broader consultation, and that meant you had a lot of people coming with very strong opposition and speaking out against it. But what the article pointed out is once you have that happening, if you still go ahead and approve it, you look like you're not listening. Yeah. And so you're kind of screwed by asking for more opinions. That's always been the big question mark with me around the issues of social licenses. It's a very ill-defined term and criteria and without a definitive answer of if you meet this condition, you then can proceed, it's just thrown a whole bunch of uncertainty into an already uncertain process. And I'm not sure either the country or the economy in general is served by adding more uncertainty into investment decisions. Well, what I, what I will predict will happen is there are going to be a lot of lawsuits filed against this project just as there are already a lot of lawsuits filed against every other pipeline planned through BC. And I'm not going to say none of them will happen, but there's going to be a lot of... It's not going to happen quickly. Yes, it'll probably get litigated out over the next several years or decades, which might actually be long enough for the prices to rebound and actually make sense to proceed with it on the uh, economic front. Or maybe we'll discover the alternative to carbon. Yeah, well, we've uh, fu- had fusion away 20 years away for the past 60 years. Maybe we'll eventually catch up. There we go. Well, we'll undoubtedly be coming back to pipelines and the politics around them because that's a perpetual story here in BC. But I think it's time to move into our next perpetual story of BC, which is the out-of-control housing bubble. And do you want to lead us into this, Scott? Yes. Okay, the Swiss Bank UBS just put out a report today 
saying that the Vancouver housing market is in a bubble. Well, actually, they said that the market is showing a housing bubble risk unmatched on the planet, and that based on their assessment, uh, Vancouver has the worst risk reward ratio of any uh, major housing market. So this isn't, I mean, the study here is news, obviously, but it's not really news to anyone who has been in Vancouver for the last five years, 10 years. And it's the, yeah, it's basically the only thing we talked about more than the rain. Yeah, is how expensive housing is. But it's, you know, another sort of piece of evidence that it's not just like a little bit out of control. They're putting us ahead of London, England. And I live in London for 18 months and I was paying a thousand pounds a month to live in a one bedroom apartment in zone three, which was about a 30 minute tube ride from central London. In context, that's about $2,000 a month. So London housing is expensive versus Vancouver has gotten to this point where there's a lot of worry about, you know, what do people our age, what do millennials, are they ever going to be able to afford a single family home? And I think the answer is obviously no, probably because you can't build more single family homes in Vancouver. Yes, we're the, the market's saturated in terms of how many single family homes can actually be built here. There just isn't room to grow Vancouver anymore outward, which of course leads to the question of where else do you go? And the obvious answer is up, but the way things are right now, that just isn't happening in the city on the scale we need it. I mean, that was one interesting story I read over the summer. There was a review of where all the new towers are going up, and they're all going up in Burnaby and the sort of suburb cities along the SkyTrain and inconvenient places because it's really the city of Vancouver that has a lot of restrictions. Like once you get into what it takes to build a new tower in Vancouver, you start realizing you can't block the view of the mountains. Like there are certain protected views and, you know, there's good arguments for that. This is a beautiful city and you don't want another but Trump tower going and blocking it. Have you ever actually it. looked at all those views? Some of them are fairly reasonable, but... There's one that's just this little tiny sliver off the Dranville Street Bridge that I don't think if you actually asked anybody what's a protected view tone, they would point to that little area right there as one of those ones that is protected or necessarily ought to be protected. I wasn't arguing that they're all rational, not yeah. even close. I bet we could probably scrap them, start over and come up with something better while still protecting the beauty that is the city. My point is even... You know, in the last couple of years, there's been a debate about a 12 story tower on uh, Commercial Drive, and that's gotten cut down, I think, to like a four story yes. tower. And maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a lot of local opposition. And that is one of the best spots in the entire city to put a tower. It's Commercial and Broadway's the main SkyTrain station where all the lines coming in from the various municipalities to the east and the south all converge. Uh, it's only the candle line coming in from Richmond that doesn't pass through that one station there. And if you're going to build dense housing, you want it right by transit. But there's just so much opposition to it, they eventually pared it down. And same thing happened with uh, another proposed structure in uh, Chinatown a few months back. Another already reasonably dense part of the city, fairly close to SkyTrain stations downtown. And that got knocked down by several stories, too, from what their initial proposal was. And it's, it's not just those isolated cases. If you ever look at a zoning map of the city, it's almost all single-family homes. And it doesn't necessarily have to be towers, but we have that missing middle in the housing market that just isn't getting built here. Well, and I walked through Shaughnessy the other day. I walked sort of from Fairview towards Oak Ridge. And you pass mansion after mansion that take up so much space. It was... Like, we're here in the middle of Kitsilano. Yeah, so we're in a fairly small single-family home area. But there are some giant mansions that cover the city of Vancouver. And it's not like there's ever going to be a, you know, kick the rich bums out and, you know, put condo towers up there. But it just sort of goes to almost a historical planning problem that's been endemic for, you know, Vancouver's history. I mean, one thing that you can say about London, at least, is they've been forced to redevelop a lot of their central areas for tragic reasons like World War II, but that did give them big empty spaces that they could then put new towers and not giant towers, but no new dense housing in. That's not something I want to happen in Vancouver, obviously, but, but we're sort of stuck with this historical situation. Yes, and 
doesn't have to be towers either. That that's always one of the problems is it always gets framed as towers first houses, but low rise apartments and low rise condo buildings are definitely an option. However, when the uh, planning process is so long and uh, fraught with challenges from every group, the amount of political capital and effort you have to spend to get a tower approved versus even a story or two above the surrounding buildings, it's just not worth it. I mean, you're lucky enough you can get the tower or anything approved, so why go to all that effort to build a low-rise condo and you're not even going to make back the money you spent just trying to get the approval done? So Vancouver's not going to get denser because there's no political capital. But what are they trying? Because there is a lot of news in there. There's three different policies yes, we could talk right about now. Maybe two. Back in the summer, the province announced they were putting a 15% tax on all real estate sales for non-residents of the province. I believe non-citizens as well. And we have started to see some results of that. The province is claiming there have been significant drop in foreign nationals purchasing properties. Yes, and sales have decreased in August in terms of sales volume. Prices have remained fairly stable, which would seem to indicate that the market is being driven by factors other than just foreign buyers and that the underlying fundamentals are keeping prices high. Though at this point, it's a little early to tell. Uh, the drop-off right after the TATS was announced could just be everybody rushed to get in before that. So well, you, you, you could have a short-term dip as those initial purchases were rushed and then it'll return to a more normal level. Or you could have people waiting out to see what's going to happen. So one month of data just really isn't enough to draw a good conclusion on. Well, and you talked about rushed, and that's almost an understatement with how poorly this policy was implemented. It's already been uh, challenged in court, and one of the uh, main challenges on this and the damages claimed is not just the alleged uh, discriminatory nature of it, but that it cost people uh, money on sales they'd already signed but hadn't closed before the TATS was uh, announced and implemented. It was sort of like if you were in the middle of a sale, you were suddenly 15% poorer than you were yes. a couple months, you know, just a week ago. That seems just poorly thought through. I, I mean, th how hard There was no it... reason it needed to happen right away. You could space it out over a couple months, extend the lead time. Even a six-month uh, window would have helped a lot on that. Yeah, you would have gotten some of the initial effect of reducing the future expectations in the markets. You might have gotten a cooling effect just on the announcement itself if you had that longer time horizon. And then you wouldn't have caught people so unaware. It was just badly implemented and really seemed to be a rush. We need to be seen to be doing something moved by the liberals more than a well-thought-out policy position. Do you think it's going to come back and bite them? I mean... I think it played well very initially that they are doing something, and it was relatively popular. Yeah, we'll have to see on that. With uh, the long-term effects still unknown, it's hard to say, but if housing prices drop significantly, I think they'll get a fair bit of people who are currently outside the market happy about it. But at the same time, you know, nobody likes it when their uh, house value drops significantly, and that's a fairly significant amount of most people's net worth that would have disappeared over there, which is one of the major disconnects in housing policy in general, is we try and do two different things with it, and it never works out well. Uh, and is housing supposed to be a consumer good that people can uh, cheaply afford, or is it supposed to be an investment tool and a wealth building mechanism uh, where housing values should go up over time and keep climbing and those two are really at odds with each other, and so far, basically, we pretend we want the affordable housing, but all the policies are built around the other one with token gestures and uh, programs to address affordability that never really get to the root of the problem. Well, I mean, I think the liberals are purposefully trying to be very cautious about bringing those housing prices down, not just because it would be unpopular, but because it would be unpopular among the people who would vote for them. I mean, the people who own houses tend to be older, wealthier, and those are the kind of people who vote BC Liberal. So you don't win re-election by knocking 20% off the wealth of your voters. 
Yes, but at the same time, there's definitely a uh, strangling effect on the overall economy when housing get that gets that unaffordable. You have talented professionals who are moving to uh, cheaper areas to live. Companies have trouble recruiting uh, into the Vancouver market. Oh yeah, I'm not denying any of that. I'm just saying but they have a obvious incentive. Yes, to my, screw millennials. Yeah, it's just don't my, vote anyway. My my point is. It's getting to the point where housing prices have risen so much and are getting so unaffordable that the other effects are starting to be felt. And even those who were previously unconcerned are starting to get concerned that housing is overall a net drain on the economy. So that's what the province tried to do, at least. And I guess we'll come back to that when we find out how this court challenge goes forward or when we have new data. But then the city of Vancouver is also trying a bunch of things that it's at least throwing out into consultations, and it's starting to really look at seriously. The first being a vacancy tax. And this idea is that if your house is left empty, you should have to pay a surcharge so that you're encouraged to either rent it out or live there. The theory being there is a large number of vacant houses in the city of Vancouver, and there's mixed data on that. It's really hard to say at the moment. I mean, there's some studies that say Oh, it's, you know, a very high percent, but those studies are just sort of people walking around looking in the windows. And then there's sort of BC Hydro data looking at how much electricity is used. And those say it's maybe, what I actually don't see in a lot of this data is how does Vancouver compare to other equivalent markets? Yes. Because if we are on par, then it's not a vacancy issue. But if there is no vacancies or if there are these empty houses, then it is an issue. So I guess the vacancy tax, it's under consultations, but the sort of initial plan I saw, I wasn't actually that impressed with. The idea was you'd only have to pay the tax, and it's not clear how much it would be, but it would be basically an extra property tax. If your house was empty for more than a year, as in if you came and stayed in it a weekend, you might be exempt. If you were retired, I think there was an exemption. There were a bunch of other exemptions that sort of meant you could probably get away with very few, if any, people actually paying this tax. Right, and that's always the problem. Taxes that are written so that there's a lot of exemptions and uh, loopholes around. I I think any economist would tell you, you want broad, simple rules when it comes to taxes, and all those various exceptions seem to be anything but. And I mean, the other side of this vacancy tax, because a lot of people might try to get away with it, by going to Airbnb or something, is actual regulations over short-term rentals in the city. Because right now, every Airbnb is pretty much an unregulated Wild West in the city. And so the idea would be to prohibit entirely people from turning their vacant house into a full-time Airbnb, and instead saying you have to live there at least some of the time, or rent it out as a proper lease, and then you have to get a permit for short-term rentals. And that was the policy announced today, I believe, or the yeah. proposal. I'll have to see how that plays, but it doesn't really seem to be getting at the core of the problem, though, which is rentals on a short-term basis taking up housing supply is only really a problem because the housing supply is so restricted here. And does, in theory, Airbnb is this really great thing. We have underutilized assets that can now be put to more productive uses, and there's a lot of potential productivity gains right there, but if it if there's some other part of the market that isn't functioning, you can have all these distorting effects. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for things like Airbnb, and it plays into the sharing economy more broadly. But I mean, I've always sort of been hesitant about that, and I haven't generally used Uber except when I was in Lima, and it was actually safer than using a cab off the street. Because it's sort of unregulated, it relies on a sort of technocratic ideal where user reviews are your form of regulations and it's a sort of libertarian ideal only that works for me as a you know young healthy white man but that doesn't mean it works for everyone and there's a lot of chances of the people running these being taken advantage there's a lot of chances of you just walking into an asbestos filled hellhole yes and so you do need i think you do need some regulations at least if we're going to have hotel regulations if we're not going to have regulations we can't have this sort of dual system where airbnb lives in the free west and hotels have to be held to a proper standard so yeah it's definitely an issue technology is really changing the uh knowledge costs and how easy it is to transmit that information around so there's definitely a, a potential that we don't 
have those relative regulations right in light of the current level of communication that's possible and in information sharing on it. But it's one of those things I think we're going to have to be sorting out for probably the next decade or so. And I expect this is going to be a recurring problem in the uh, early 21st century politics. For sure. But that's not to say Airbnb regulations are going to do a damn bit of difference to the housing crisis. I mean, it's sort of a solution for a specific problem that... It's a band-aid on a gaping flesh wound. I guess the final question I really have about these, how will these policies play at the sort of municipal level? I know we're a few years away from another election, but Gregor Robertson's been mayor for a while, and Vision Vancouver is really the only political force in the city right now. Do you think this is enough to keep them popular? I haven't seen a poll to say they're super popular, but... I haven't seen it. Yeah, I also haven't seen any recent uh, polling on uh, municipal government and what the potential is for upcoming elections on that. But it'll probably help them a bit, at least in the short term, because they will be seen to be doing something. Being seen to be doing something is often better than doing nothing. Or, unfortunately, being seen doing something is better than not being seen but doing the right thing. And I guess there aren't a lot of strong challengers really presenting alternative models. I mean, there is the sort of far left of Vancouver politics saying, well, we should just build a bunch more affordable housing. And there's a good argument for that. But it's always how do you do that and also do it affordably? And where does that money come from? Yes, because the amount of money needed to really build out that quantity of housing is prohibitive, in just the sheer amount of it, especially for issues of how do you raise that capital. The city government doesn't have the ability to borrow that much money. The province is, I was a little iffy on that, and they have their own budget constraints with rising healthcare costs and everything else, uh, eating away into their budgets. And in terms of addressing stuff, so we keep coming back to density is definitely one of those issues, but Vision's one of the more pro-density parties. Uh, yeah. I mean, they take enough developer money that you would expect them to support some development. But Yes, v- Vision is one of the more developer-friendly or development-friendly parties. But even that, if you actually look at how they're going about it, it's very much a piecemeal, we'll do it one lot at a time, that doesn't seem to be actually getting to the root of the problem. It's just kind of doing a very slow turnover without correcting for the underbuilding that's happened over the past several decades. It doesn't help that the province and the uh, local government keeps playing it off each other in the, you need to solve this problem for us. The liberals are all too happy to point out the supply issues and tell the city to go fix their problem. The city wants to talk to the, get the government at the provincial level to come in and put in a whole bunch of taxes to try and address demand on housing and what it leads to is a fairly inefficient way to keep the government accountable to it because they always have the some other level of government is the problem here so that's a housing crisis for now which we'll undoubtedly come back to for a final segment we're going to go through a handful of stories fairly quickly just to sort of give our quick takes on them do you want to lead us off Okay, first up is debate follow-up from our teaser episode. As you all know, the U.S. presidential election had their first debate on Monday. The general consensus being that Hillary Clinton dominated the debate. That actually surprised me. I mean, most debates you have this sort of spin follow-up that's, oh, so-and-so won, or then the other one's saying they won. But this was almost, maybe it's just the echo chamber I live in, but it was Trump bombed. Yeah, even the more traditional right-friendly but not necessarily partisan commentators definitely came away with the same impression that there was a noticeable mismatch in terms of quality of debate and who performed better. A lot of people were impressed that Hillary was able to so effectively knock Trump off his game and fairly quickly. Yeah. Like people would talk about how well he did in the first, you know, 20 minutes in the trade discussion. But as soon as she started needling him on his personal businesses, he gets so offended almost at attacks on his personality, on his acumen, that he starts to have to talk about how great his temperament is and how great his business is, even when... 
Nothing says good temperament like yelling about how good a temperament yeah, you have. Or bragging about how you don't pay taxes because you're that much smarter and that much better at business. So it'll be interesting, I guess, to see over the next week how the polls shift if they do. Yes, in my opinion. Are already the initial trend lines on uh, 538's poll aggregator are definitely showing a noticeable uptick in the Hillary polls and a drop in Trump. Uh, right now, it is 43 to 40 percent on the U.S. election, and I think we can expect that to continue on, at least in the short term, once the initial polls go through, whether or not that can be maintained is anyone's guess at this point. All right. Well, we'll keep following that. For our next story, there was a big announcement from the BC Green Party today that they are no longer going to accept corporate or union donations. And I mean, I guess it might come as a surprise to some people that they actually had any corporate or union donations, and they did. Apparently, it was about 15% of their funding last year. But as part of their commitment to taking big money out of BC politics, where it's pretty much the Wild West, there are Americans donating to our political elections, even to our municipal elections. Yes, the policies surrounding campaign finance in BC, and a lot of other provinces for that matter, are pretty relaxed. Ontario has similarly lapsed policies. And oddly enough, one of the few things you can't actually do is have a federal party support a provincial party here. So you can take money from an American, uh, not even living in the province, but you can't have the federal NDP transfer money to the provincial NDP. And what it means for the Greens, bring in this new ban on corporate and union donations... It's hard to say at the moment. We've obviously seen in recent elections that the small donations, lots of grassroots supporters, is a viable method of fundraising. But in order to do that, you actually have to be able to drum up that large base of support. And do the Greens actually have that broader support base they can tap into for those $20 donations? I mean, the Greens are polling at 15% right now in BC. They're doing really well. BC Conservatives are also polling at 15%, and they effectively don't have a leader. I mean, they have the same leader they had after he resigned. That's its own little mess. Like, I think this is the right moral move for the Greens to make. It sends the right signals, and it's a you know something they can point at. I mean, it definitely sends the right signals, but what's if, interesting, it, if it hurts their election prospects, do they are they actually coming out ahead on this? Well, that's just the thing. I mean, they're at such a position where they could feasibly look at becoming a very strong force in BC, maybe not becoming official opposition, but really challenging the NDP. That's not free. That's not easy to do. And it will take money. If they can show that strength, those doors would open to the, at least having those do fundraising meetings. They've closed those doors now. So now they have to go to their membership a lot more. They have to find that 15% that support them. And my suspicion is a lot of those people don't have Green Party memberships. They aren't on the fundraising email list yet. So it'll be interesting to see how well Andrew Weaver and the Greens do at building that platform. Yeah, and I am I hope it works out for them, but I'm not sure that's a viable strategy when you're an Elso Rand party. Yeah. I mean, the Al Alberta NDP took in a lot of union and a couple corporate donations in their election, one, and then their first bill banned it. Right yeah, away. and if anything, I think that's probably the better approach from a strategy point of view is you can't make decisions in politics if you can't actually win elections or gain enough broad support that you can influence uh, those who do. And if the Green Party isn't able to get to that point because they hamstring their fundraising efforts by going out alone and, and being the only people not to play the game... Are they just hurting themselves in the long run and not being able to actually bring those policies in once it happens? Because as we just saw in Alberta, you can still take those donations and then, once you're in power, revise the laws. Play by the rules as they exist, not as you want them to. Yes. Next up, I saw today that the city of Richmond is now going to mandate that bus shelter ads have at least 50% English on them. It's been a long-standing sort of argument in Richmond where the population is almost half Chinese ethnicity, how much Chinese to allow on signs and whether there should be a requirement that English be there. 
I mean, it touches on a lot of racist angles and a lot of sort of what is it to be Canadian. But then, meanwhile, I've also seen the BC Civil Liberties Association intervene in a couple of these where they say, look, a business owner can put up whatever sign he or she wants because that's just free speech. If they don't put English, they're not going to get people who can speak English and they lose out on that business. So it's always been this sort of tension. Yes, and there's actually been a couple of cases too about uh, condo and strata boards conducting all of their business in uh, Mandarin, I believe it was. That, if anything, is a little more problematic because those are effectively legal uh, institutions and tra- and transactions that are going on. And that, there's, I think, a fairly solid argument to limit to the official languages or at least have one of the official languages present uh, to conduct business in. But for signs on uh, businesses, and especially advertising, where it really is all about targeting the people you want you think are best to sell that product to it doesn't seem to be an area of compelling state interest to intervene in and it's absolutely one of those areas where you let the market sort itself out yeah i see this as coming back to bite the city council of richmond as someone sues them and probably somebody who runs ad block on my computer not having fewer ads directed at me is just generally a good thing there you go Finally, a policy announcement from the BC NDP that they will introduce a $10 a day childcare program if elected. I mean, this is something we've seen other provinces campaign on. The NDP did it federally. Yes, it's, that it's was... been a longstanding uh, campaign platform of the federal NDP, usually modeled after the Quebec system, which is, that would struck me as a little odd, because when you actually look at how the Quebec system runs... It tends to be the people who are able to get in early and believe several studies, and I may be wrong on this, have shown that those programs tend to be most beneficial to people who work regular office hours, nine to five, and are in the upper middle class to wealthy. So it's always been a somewhat odd position for a ostensibly progressive party to put forward, but... I suppose it also goes to the more universalizing instance in their approach to public policy rather than the more targeted ones like the federal liberals did with their child care benefit. Yeah. I mean, it's just good to see them actually talk about something rather than... Well, it's not even that they were opposing anything. It's just good to actually know that there is a official opposition in this province. All right. And that has been Politicoast. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Pod. Leave us a review and let us know what you think. Really, tell us how to make this show better. Thanks for listening. Thanks.